AJ coming back today? Or? Uh, yeah, we should uh, hopefully have him out there, see how he progresses uh, as the week goes on. Activating anybody else? Or I know that was uh, we'll time. practice Mayfield today. And we'll have three weeks to make a decision. Uh, what was, uh, you know, with AJ um, out, uh, how did everybody do? And, you know, what, what would it be to, what would it mean to get him back for a game like this? Well, I mean, anytime you've got guys out that uh, you rely on that are, you know, some of your top guys that week in and week out, you want to you get them back there. But you got to do what's best for the player first and then the team. And so, you know, every team deals with different obstacles, D-led. Um, what happens during the NFL season. So, you know, we try to play the strengths of our guys. Every game is different, how you got to play it and how they try to attack you. So hopefully we can get them back and, you know, help us win. With an offensive lineman, is there a traditional ramp up period just in terms of the physicality of what they've been able to do? I think any, any football player, Josh, you know, when you, no matter how great of a shape you're, you know, you're in, I mean, it's always the problem. It's the act of doing the football movements and everybody's different. Uh, certainly take that into consideration, you know, when you haven't practiced for a couple of months to get back out there, uh, you, you know, you just have to see where they're at and assess it and make sure that they're in a good place and healthy and they can help you. So uh, I think the longer you're away from it, you know, it could, it could be a challenge and it just depends what it's have to see what it looks like. In terms of when you guys were drafting last year, what, how did you guys evaluate Justin Fields? Like we evaluate every player, you, you, you evaluate what your every player we've ever looked at. Um, you know, unless you're sitting in those meeting rooms, you can have a lot of theories schematically what they're asking them to do. Uh, you know, you, you have scouts that get information. Some of it's reliable. Some of it's coach speak. Uh, you know, you're trying to get the the truth about where they fit uh, as the as a player, as a person, what they've asked them to do in college, what would actually carry over. And that's no different than when we looked at Brisker. I mean, all these guys, Gordon, uh, every year. Our, our scouting staff, football staff does a tremendous job, but those are, it's a long, thorough process. So every player is different. So I'm not sure something specific you're looking for there. I was just kind of how you maybe thought, because when you guys were looking at it, you had the number four pick and it was available at that point in time. But there, there's, when a, lot maybe there's a lot of players available. There, there are a lot of players. Just my, if I'm asked, right, three would have been gone. So. Um, you know, I went to North Carolina, so, it, you know, I can I at least count to three, though. And uh, so anybody after the first three, you know, everybody has, there, there are a lot of players available, so that you, you could go down that rabbit hole a lot of different ways. I, I guess I was just getting at from a quarterback, quarterback specific, like you're talking about what translates. What did you think maybe in this game would translate well or, or that you have questions about? Well, there's a lot of quarterbacks that come out every year. And, you know, it's about – Guys that get drafted, there are a lot of things that, that can alter their careers. Um, and so no two situations are the same so when you're looking at them and where you're at in your program. And um, you can't take every player. So, you know, some of them, you know, history, you know, you got a little bit of luck. You know, you get to an environment where you're not – you've seen guys' careers where they haven't been asked to do a whole lot early in their career. And they, they won a lot of football games because they're on – and stable organizations and good teams. And then eventually, so they get a couple of years into it and all those reps, they're completely different players. There's plenty of examples of that. The guys, there's other examples of guys that maybe they could have been high-end players, uh, unstable places, systems change a bunch, coaches come in and out, that can alter their career. The environment, organization's not strong. They can't handle the ups and downs of the everyday narrative and they overreact and it, it can uh, ruin guys' careers. So if you've seen both sides of it. so. The hypothetical part is hard because no two situations are the same. Uh, there's a lot of good players that come out every year. And again, some of it's luck, fit, timing. A lot of people said, oh, yeah, um, he's the top guy on my board, and they don't take him to the fifth round. Well, you passed him up. You passed over four times. You know, So we, you know, there's a lot of revisionist history there, too. Um, but no different than you know, last week playing P.J. Walker. Had a different transition to the NFL. I mean, every week's a challenge, uh, and it's – the conventional, the easy narratives to say, well, okay, you didn't. I mean, you do that every year. A defensive player is this and that, and it may not have been the, the best fit for you. And that, and that player may not have been the most successful because of where you may have been at, or maybe schematically what you're doing. There's a lot of factors there. Staying with Justin away from the draft process, what kind of challenges is he going to present for you guys on Sunday? 
Yeah, there's different challenges. Their, their run game is, um, is rolling, and he's been a big part of that. And uh, you can see how they've adapted really probably since that Washington game Thursday night, right? And then they, they came back, and they're, they're running more design runs. Um, they're not all traditional. That's why it always kind of makes me laugh. You get the, the surface hot takes, and they try to compare just based on stats. But when you really look at it schematically and what, what they're asking players to do, and then you see guys' skill sets show up and then a lot of direct runs. You see a lot of the, what's trending in the league, copy and paste. We've seen a little bit of it. You see the, the gap scheme pullers maybe asking them to, to read it. And if you don't, you're not sound and you're fit, it can be a problem. You see traditional zone reads, but again, how somebody coached it, the guy may just pull it, I call it like a heat check, and he gets around the edge and he gets downhill is a problem. So um, that's where his skill set, as he gets vertical and make those cuts, he gets vertical and makes those cuts, it, it's, he's had some big plays and they had some success and they've, They've kept the ball and they've had some long drives and then they get down there and they've, they've schemed up some things to Komet. You overplay it and Komet's got a really good feel and you know they're in pressure and you see them coming in a, in a, in a delay against Miami, there's nobody there. You see Detroit last week, give you a run formation, they cut it the wrong way, right there. So like that's what they've been doing. They've been staying on the field. They've shortened the game and he's been a big part of it. Design runs. And then really, really the play extensions, those can be the backbreakers. You get to third and seven, you're not disciplined on your rush lanes, guys fly up the field, you're breaking tackles, and then he gets vertical and it's a, and it's a problem. And then those, again, those long methodical drives, and that's what's kept them in games late. Um, I know they haven't won them, but they've, they've been in games late because they've been able to hold the ball and make enough plays and uh, shorten it down from the other, other side. Not, not different. I mean, it's kind of what Carolina did uh, since Wilkes took over. And you'll see some of the same schemes there. Four by one, zone read, try to get advantage throws. Maybe he keeps it, maybe he gives it. Uh, we're just, you know, get the first and ten. Sometimes it's second and, se second and seven, and there's third and two, and then it's everything's on the table. Direct run to the quarterback. So there, you're seeing a lot of that stuff. It's probably more similar to Carolina than any other recent opponent. Defensively, does this uh, defensively will your scheme principles have to adjust to that, or uh, it's all about scheme? Um, no, well, I'm not going to give you game plan. Well, I'll, I'll give you game plan right oh, now. No, no, I'll just go. I'll just. Hey, I'll no, go. I know what you're saying. Yes, yeah, yeah. put it this way. Can yeah. you spy with Troy Anderson? <laughs> <laughs> That's real yeah. deep. That's what, real scheme. <laughs> well, what, what's what are you playing behind it? Huh? What uh, coverage are you playing behind it? Um, you, you could go go two or three. Quarters. Well, okay, what are you going to do if they drop back? You know, he's not in the right, uh, you know, right spot on the field. So, in all seriousness, though, there's a lot of, a lot of things. Got, people have tried different, different stuff, the way that fits their defense. Uh, you got to be gap sound because they got their traditional runs. You know, they, they, there's clearly a lot on the call sheet because you're seeing a lot of one time scheme things too mm -hmm. to go with the traditional runs. Uh, you know, the one back under center stuff, even some of the stuff they do in two back. Uh, that I call traditional runs, uh, where you got to be sound. And when you add the quarterback to it, if you're out of place, uh, which happens, you know, they do a good job. They bring a guy back. People get caught in certain schemes. They pack it in there. You outrun it. There's nobody behind them except the free safety. So uh, you saw that versus Detroit. Okay. Yeah, I just, the people around here have seen, seen when uh, Spoon used to shadow Cam Newton in the goal and they something. Yeah, I mean, We've had it. Eberflus did it to us with uh, Darius Leonard with Marcus, but it came more on third down and spot, spied him. And you got a player like that, certainly, but it's got to be in the right situation. Um, like I'm sure they'll have a spy at some points for us. How, how has your thought process um, changed, if, if it has, over the course of your career? How much time is enough time to get into a drive? To, to have a legitimate, we're not just winging it out there, but we can move the ball. There's no context here of anything specific that y'all done, other than the fact that there was used to be something called a two-minute offense, and that seems like forever now. You know, it's like you know, 35 seconds. Folks are able to move down the field. Has, has it changed in the way? Is the way that you think about it changed over the course of your career? It depends. You know who. You've had personnel-wise, um, 
yeah, I mean, that's why if you've got your timeouts, it's different than the college game. The college game, two minute seems like an eternity because the clock stops on the uh, on the earn first and they got to set the ball. I think, again, going to your personnel, um, there was times in Tennessee where come hell or high water, you know, you may hand the ball off a few times because because it gave you an advantage with, with Derek where you may not have done that, but he could take a three yard run, maybe four yard run, and he'd pop, give you 16, 17, and you get moving in the drive. Um, you certainly saw the craziness of the Minnesota uh, Buffalo, right? And then the skill sets of the guys that are, I think maybe there's more quarterbacks that are extending plays that you're getting more chunk plays. Maybe has altered some of the traditional two minute dink and dunk and what you're talking about, rhythm, two-minute offense. Um, I think that probably has a lot to do with it. There's a lot of quarterbacks that can extend plays, and maybe you know they're back there for four or five seconds, and then somebody comes open, and they're able to launch the ball. Uh, you've seen that. You've seen some non-traditional two-minute, which teams are doing. Again, maybe trying to get a chunk play instead of just a rhythm passing from like the Joe Montana hurry up. Right. Yeah, you're certainly seeing different ways that people are doing it. Yeah, that's if that's. I'm assuming that's what you're asking. Yeah, 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 exactly. So to follow up then, you say, do these quarterbacks, have these quarterbacks changed the way defenses are playing the two-minute, the 30-second situation? Yeah, you got to adapt. I mean, it's no different than, you know, a couple of years ago, people would get into no huddle, hurry up, think you could lock them into a couple of calls. Well, just like the college games adapted on the line of scrimmage, so was the NFL. I don't know a defense that can't get to all their calls on the line of scrimmage. If – that were the case, probably still wouldn't be in this league. You know, you got to assume that they're going to catch up and they're going to adapt. There's always that going on from year to year. Uh, that's probably why you're seeing scoring down, among other reasons. That, that you've got to assume that they're going to adapt. They're smart players and good, uh, smart coaches on the other side too. And that's the, the people always forget. I say this a lot, but in football, I mean, there's 11 on their side. The defense has a say in things. So sometimes it's not just about what you're doing. One of their guys may win a one-on-one. -on -one. You may think you got the best play called, and oh damn, it's wide open. Well, it comes down to the fundamentals of the line of scrimmage. You don't block the matchup one-on-one. -on -one, a guy gets beat, poor technique, destroys a play. So a lot that goes into it. Um, but you're certainly seeing people adapt because it's out of necessity. You mentioned the copy and paste play calling around the league, but it's hard to it's hard to replicate the, the skills that Fields brings. You mentioned money that he's probably the strongest guy in their backfield. How different does that make facing this? Yeah, because I mean, you see it with different guys, and if you know some guys are speed guys, they're quick, and you know you're they can make you look stupid when you're doing the hole, and then you're like you're wrapping up air, and they got up under you, and then you get guys that when they pull it, they can outrun you, and they can break tackles. They put their foot in the ground, and they're explosive going north south, and it's a problem, um, and that's why you know guys that can get out of things in the pocket, they have a good rush. To get them off the spot, and you collapse them, and then they can't bring them down, and then it gets going. And those are backbreakers because it keeps those drives going. And he's done a nice job of that. But to go back to the copy and paste, you may run up with a with a smaller guy, maybe same scheme, may have a back like Chubb, for example. Some of that gap read stuff they were doing, hand it to Chubb. Now Chubb's the main problem. Or you get into certain things you guys have seen over the years from a guy like Cam Newton when he keeps it. Well, it's a different set of problems. So that's that's why week to week it changed. You may see the same scheme, but depending on who's back there, there's a different obstacle beyond the scheme, just going by personnel. They just placed Khalil Hubbard on IR. Mm -hmm. um, how does that complicate your, your scheme? It I mean, it's just like everything. I mean, they got to prepare for our guys, you know, whether AJ plays or not. I mean, that's kind of week to week. And you put a guy down, I mean, he's a good player. Uh, they got other good players, you know, Ebner. Been a problem. It could be a problem. The kick return game, turn one at Baylor. You know, those are things you gotta gotta take into account. With Jalen coming back, what are some of the things y'all have to kind of monitor and watch for the uh, the bigger guy making the, the comeback? Make yeah, sure I mean, some other question. You know, Josh asked. Um, it's just case by case. It's not necessarily a bigger guy. It's just gotta assess where they're at. No player is the same. I mean, that's why no injury is the same. A guy could have a hamstring, and again, it's. That's why if you give a timetable, sometimes you can set some poor narratives on people that aren't fair. And uh, you just got to take it do you like case by case. We'll assess it and do what's best for the player and then best with the team. This might be much more of a psychological question. Okay. Uh, when it comes to Marcus, 
the, just the conversation outside of the building. You say it's not a situation, but the conversation outside of the building. Do you have to talk to him just psychologically to say, hey, listen, don't read some of what maybe is being talked about outside? Like, do you have that conversation? Because he's a guy that has in the past said, you know, I, I have been so much of a perfectionist. Like, I, it seems like he's a guy that... Yeah, we have a lot of conversations with a lot of our players. Uh, I've said it many a times, and you know what you sign up for as a coach and, and player. Um, if you're dumb enough to uh, look at social media or get, you know, spot on on TikTok, you know, shame on you. But you know what you sign up for. You're in the public or in the biggest reality show going, right? So if that's part of it, it'll crush you. I mean, I mean, just think of the comical, go back three weeks ago and what people were saying about Brady and Rodgers. You're talking about guys that have won Super Bowls and MVPs, and it's what you, you know. So, and I get it; it's what sells and on it. But that is part of the job for any player, or coach, and uh, that's reality. And that's why you need perspective because you li literally could go back three weeks, and they were uh, they had those those guys probably five feet in the ground, putting dirt on the casket. Well, you see what happens. You know, it's such a long season, long journey. But uh, I think for any player, Mike, it's a good question, but for any coach too. Uh, if, like I said, if you're insecure or dumb enough to go down that rabbit hole, shame on you. I guess even maybe to go a step further with that, you know, fam, you know, family. Like I know, even Marcus case, his wife does the social media, and like you know, I know. Does that do you does that play into it too? Because that's different than a player or a coach. Yeah, when um, when I get on my burner account and like take shots at you, does it affect you? I can't. I can't speak for somebody. I appreciate the nine, two, three, eight. It's D Bassity. Yep. Oklahoma. Oh one champs, right? Bass. Yeah, two thousand. Excuse me. It was the Orange Bowl. I should know that, right? B Florida State. Hypel. Yeah, I was there. Hell. So that part of Bassity lines burn, and we take shots at you guys. You know, it's maybe it has the effect. Um, but in all seriousness, I mean, that's part of the challenge of being in the public spotlight for any player. Um, but how everybody handles it, you know, that's case by case. It's probably a better question to ask the player.